my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that curse
Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Bjorn. Welcome to Worship with the Y Church as we start this new month of November. It's great to have you with us on Facebook Live and YouTube. Remember, being a, a first Sunday of the month, this is Communion Sunday. And so make sure that you have set aside uh, bread or crackers and wine or juice as we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper together later in our time today. Every weekend, we have uh, two worship opportunities. This one, of course, online. And then in this season, we're actually meeting on Saturdays at 4 o'clock at the YMCA. Uh, the Y is completely closed on Sundays. And so in this pandemic season, uh, month by month, right now we've been worshiping on, on Saturdays at 4 o'clock, and it's been fantastic. As you feel comfortable and would like to be there, uh, we'd love to see you at the Y um, for that late Saturday afternoon service. Uh, we mask up per MDH guidelines. We're spread out across the gym. We have a little check-in station when you first come in uh, in case contact tracing would be necessary. We also have child care that's available, and uh, you can take advantage of that as you'd like. And it's just a great family-friendly environment. One of my favorite things last weekend was after the worship service was over, was just tossing the football with some of the kids it's one of the great benefits of being a church in a YMCA gym. So that is Saturdays at 4. Uh, we're also here online uh, every Sunday at 9.30. For kids ministry and Sunday school in this season, that is also happening online. And you will see that post every weekend, uh, every Saturday morning by about 7 a.m. Student ministry is also finding creative ways to meet each Wednesday. So middle school students are alternating between Zoom and in-person gatherings at the Y. This week, it's a Zoom week. So we'll see our middle schoolers online at 6.30 on Wednesday night. High school students are meeting in person every week at the Y uh, in the community room. And so that's uh, 6.30 for our high school students uh, Wednesdays at the Y. Speaking of students, this is the weekend where we give new Bibles to our ninth graders. So at our in-person gathering at the Y yesterday, we did that. And uh, we want to share it with you as well, just so you can see these names and can be in prayer for these ninth graders. And so I encourage you to you know, take a quick screenshot or take a picture with your phone and get these names so that you can pray over them. You know, it's a big deal to start high school. And it is a big deal within the context of our church community to begin what we call confirmation. And confirmation is really rightly defined uh, student-focused discipleship. 
as kids are growing into young adults and deciding to follow Jesus. So as a church family, we believe there's no greater gift that we could give to students than the gift of God's word. And so yesterday, uh, these students received the Bible with their name imprinted on the front cover. Actually looks very much like this one uh, with their name and silver lettering at the bottom. And we always call this our, our textbook for confirmation. This is what uh, we want to get to know, that this book where the words of life are contained as we get to know God and his plans for our life. We're especially mindful today of what it means to be able to follow Jesus and to own a Bible and to gather for worship, whether in person or online, because today happens to be the International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church. There are many places across the globe where to follow Jesus means being rejected by your community. It could mean losing your job, being driven from your home, being imprisoned, or even risking your very life. Uh, at our in-person worship service, we had this prayer card that we handed out. It's a prayer card with a bookmark inside. And if you would like one, we would love to send you one. We have extras and uh, we would put this in the mail and, and get it to you this week. So just email us at info at the ychurch.org with your name and address. And we'll send that along as we encourage one another to remember our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ in prayer. Prayer is such a key part of our life together. And we would love to pray specifically for you. So we have an opportunity to do that by emailing prayer at the ychurch.org. Uh, with a praise report, with a prayer request, and we'll get that to our prayer team this week, and uh, we'll actively be in prayer for you. We'd love to do that. Remember, too, if you uh, would like just pastoral care and support, you can always reach us on the phone at 763-250-9504. Financial giving is also part of our worship life together, and we have seen such generosity this year in the midst of very challenging times. We're so grateful for the generosity that you have shown. There are a few different ways to give at the Y Church. And so just list those real quick. You can hop online to the ychurch.org slash egiving uh, for our, our web-based giving. You can use mobile giving by texting YGIVE to 77977. Or snail mail works too. So you can reach us at our, our office there at the YMCA and, uh, and that would find us as well if you want to send in a check. Again, thank you for sustaining our mission, the mission we're on together to seek Jesus, connect together and share his love. We've got a great Bible passage coming up for us in just a few minutes as we are in our series called The Doctor is In, Discipleship in Luke. We're going to be in Luke 14 today, so have your Bible at the ready. Uh, and, and just a great passage that is about humility. And two days before Election Day, I find the timing is impeccable as we learn to practice greater humility toward one another. Uh, we're going to sing a couple songs first and hear our beginner's Bible reading before we get into that. But there is one last thing that I wanted to share before we send, uh, send things off into the rest of our service. Yesterday was not just Halloween, but was Reformation Day. And that makes today, November 1st, All Saints Day. Now, you might have a picture of a, a saint as someone who lived a long time ago, lived a incredibly holy life and, and then was recognized by the Catholic Church. But the Bible uses the term saint to refer to all those who have trusted in Jesus and given faithful witness to who he is. So on All Saints Day, we remember all those in the church family who have died and have gone on before us to be with the Lord, especially remembering those in this past year who have, have passed on. We're going to remember those names now uh, in prayer together, and then I'm going to leave some space for you, whether silently or right out loud where you are, to, to name those loved ones who you are remembering today who have gone on to be with the Lord. So with that, let's bow our heads and pray together. Today, Lord, we remember and give thanks to you for the lives of Barb Evenson, Pat Cooper, Nancy Stafford, Albina Evenson, Nikki Holmes, 
Carol Whitcomb, and Alvira Wyrock. And we remember and give thanks for those that we name before you now. Lord, thank you for the true and faithful witness of these loved ones who are with you now in glory. And would you give each of us strength to finish our own race well, that we would shine brightly for you as saints under your grace. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing together. This heart open wide from the depths, from the heights, I will bring a sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring a sacrifice.
light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving first miracle. Jesus went to a wedding with his mother Mary and his disciples. Mary heard the servants say, there is no more wine. What can we do? Mary told the servants, do what Jesus tells you to do. Jesus said, fill up six jars of water, dip out a cup and give it to your master. When they did, they saw wine instead of water. The servants were amazed. When their master tasted the wine, he told the groom, You have saved the, be the very best wine for last. The disciples were also amazed. This was Jesus' first miracle. Thanks, Elias. You did a great job reading for us today. Elias is one of the ninth graders who will be receiving a Bible this weekend. And uh, one of the things I love about the story that he read for us is that it is a picture of Jesus hanging out at a wedding party. Our scripture passage later today, Jesus chooses that same scene of a wedding feast to teach us another important lesson. Now at this time, we get to say a blessing over our kids and really anyone who God might bring to your mind today. You will see the blessing on the screen and you can fill the name of the person that you're praying for in the blank. Our new kids blessing for the month of November comes from Psalm 136, which is also the memory verse for those who are participating in our virtual kids ministry this month. Will you say this with me? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love lasts forever. It's not a good promise from the Lord today that 
uh, we can give thanks to him in all circumstances because his love for us never changes. Now we are going to take a few minutes to talk about our table question for the day. If you could eat dinner anywhere tonight, where would you go? It could be someplace near home that you haven't been for a while because of the pandemic or a favorite restaurant from a vacation you've been on, or maybe it's just something that you are craving right now. We would love to hear from you in the Facebook comments, so drop us a note and we will be back in a couple of minutes to hear from scripture. So you could also grab your Bible and turn to Luke 14 as we continue in worship today. Good morning, Y Church. My name is Kathy Palm, and I am part of the leadership team here at the Y Church. October is Pastor Appreciation Month. I wanted to take a moment to lift up and appreciate the pastors here at the Y Church, Bjorn, his wife Esther, Megan, and her husband Jeff. Thank you so much uh, from the bottom of our hearts for your leadership and just uh, walking us through this challenging year of 2020. We so appreciate you. At our Saturday in-person worship, uh, on behalf of the congregation and the leadership team, some of our leadership team members did um, present Bjorn and Megan uh, and their spouses a small token of our appreciation. And I just wanted to take a moment here to be able to read a Bible verse uh, that I thought was fitting today uh, while honoring you as our, our leaders. And it's from Thessalonians 5, verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Again, thank you so much. We appreciate you and your families. And um, thank you not only just today or October as Pastor Appreciation Month, but just every day. God bless. When he noticed how the guests picked their places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host will invite both of you and will come say to you, Give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have take. You will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when you, have, when your host comes, he will say to you, "Friend, move up to a better place." Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For those who have exalted themselves will be humbled, and for those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers your, or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteousness. Thank you to Andrew for reading scripture for us today. Andrew is a high school freshman this year, and it has been a privilege to be led in worship by our students today. I've been so inspired by both our middle and high school students in the last several months as they have navigated so much change and challenges with school and distance learning. And it really has been such an encouragement to see their faith continue to grow. And if you think about it, everything in their life has shifted. Even their lunchroom experiences look dramatically different from this time to last year. For some of us, the question I'm going to ask you next may require thinking farther back for some than for others, but I am wondering if you remember what your high school lunchroom looked like. Do you remember where you sat, who you sat with? Did who you were sitting with change? What did it smell like? What was painted on the walls? Well, the lunchroom at Ripon High School in Ripon, Wisconsin was a significant part of my high school career. This was where friendships were often made or broken, where conversations about boys and band class and family matters were discussed at length. And it's also where, with a bird's eye view, you could see the entire class structure of our high school. And not necessarily by grade, but by status and popularity. There was one table smack dab in the middle of the cafeteria that my friends and I always sat at. It was a round table and we would crowd about eight to 10 chairs around it. Every day at 1121, when that bell would ring, our group of friends would head directly to this table. Now, on our first day of senior year, we apparently arrived at the lunchroom a few minutes late because remember distinctly standing there with our lunch boxes and trays, and there was a group of freshman girls who had already sat down at our table. We asked them if they would move. This after all was our table. We had claimed it at the beginning of our high school career and we're not about to give it up senior year. Now there was absolutely nothing special about this table except that we had decided that it was ours. And I like to think that we asked politely, but I really don't remember to be honest. I mostly just remember being satisfied with the outcome when we sat down as this group of freshman girls walked away. Now you might think, on one hand, that seems fair. Seniors should have ranking over freshmen. But why? Who decided that? Because we are older, that means we have more rights to a lunchroom table. My guess is that the freshman girls who moved away that day don't really remember that it happened, but I certainly do. And that was a long time ago now, but it has caused me to reflect on what it looks like to live the way that Jesus invites us to, to a life of humility, instead of following our culture's cues on who is right or who is on top. In our text today, Jesus turns the table, so to speak, on the Pharisees and guests that he's eating with. You will turn with me to Luke 14, where we'll be this morning. That would be great. So we're going to be in Luke 14, starting in verse 7. And Jesus is at the home of one of the rulers of the Pharisees. Now last week, Bjorn spoke to what happens right before the story that we're going to get to today. Jesus has just healed a man who had abnormal swelling, and he healed him on the Sabbath. The people in the room are already on edge. After all, a Jewish man has just broken the law and also healed someone right before their very eyes. Jesus is there to eat bread with them, and he knew that he was being watched closely. But of course, Jesus was also watching closely. As people filed in, Jesus noted how the guests chose their seats at the meal. And rather than calling them out on it directly, he decides to tell a story, as he so often does. We call these stories parables. And he says to them, when you are invited to a wedding feast, 
don't sit down in the best place in case someone more honorable than you is invited. The host might come and say to you, you need to give up your place, and then you would take the walk of shame to a less important seat. Instead, when you're invited, go sit in the lowest place so that when the host comes and says to you that you can move up to a better seat, you will have glory in the presence of those who are at the table with you. And then the purpose and the punchline, or rather the punch in the gut of the story is this. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. When I read this story, what comes to mind is like an airplane seating situation. Imagine that someone with an economy ticket sits down in first class. The person with a first class ticket is escorted to their seat by the flight attendant, who promptly asks you to move and you take the walk of shame to your economy seat. How different is it when you go to your economy seat and the flight attendant comes to you and says that they have a seat for you in first class? This happened to me just one time and I felt like I won the lottery. What is interesting though, isn't it, about Jesus' approach to this story is that he doesn't negate this system that's in place. He doesn't act like you should just um, not have any of these social cues, but instead he addresses how you navigate in the social setting in which they were living. But story time isn't over yet. He keeps going and he turns to the host, who's the Pharisee, who's the one that committed to keeping the law and doing the things the right way. And he says, when you host a party, don't ask your friends, your relatives, and your rich neighbors to come. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Invite all of the people who can never repay you, never ask you back over for a meal, and you will be blessed. Now, not unlike the high school lunchroom, meals in the first century world highlighted social disparities. This might also hit close to home if you think back to trying to make your wedding seating chart. But Jesus' desire is to disallow class mentality. The poor and the powerless should be welcome at the table with the Pharisees and religious leaders. Jesus' call to inclusion echoes his mission statement that's laid out in Luke 4, 18, which you might recall from a couple of messages in our series out of Luke where Jesus reads from the scroll of Isaiah. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. You hear that same language from Jesus' parable with the Pharisee to invite the poor and the blind. And this idea that the poor would be blessed, that Jesus would have come for them, would have been so inconceivable to Greeks and Romans. They believed that because the poor were trying to do whatever they had to to survive, that they were more likely to do things like lie, steal, and cheat whereas the wealthy were more likely to be honest because they could afford to. Now today, we are used to a society where upward mobility is possible. Jesus is speaking during a time where social mobility could come through wealth, but the majority of people never climbed the social ladder because the Greeks and the Romans and the ruling classes saw it as a duty of every citizen to preserve the boundaries of the class structure. Social status affected every area of life, including meals. Jeffers, who wrote The Greco-Roman World of the New Testament Era, gives us insight into what it was like to live in these times. He says, A person's place at the table and the quality of food served depended on the person's status. Can you imagine going to a dinner party and being served, say, a McDonald's cheeseburger, while other guests on the other side of the room are having steak and lobster? Now, I don't know if this is a totally fair comparison, but I think it gives us a picture to understand the cultural atmosphere of the day. Jesus' teaching is a significant reversal from cultural norms, a theme that we see over and over in the book of Luke. This is not a lesson, however, in earning God's favor through strategic seating charts. Rather, it's an invitation to a life with Jesus. 
There are two invitations that stood out to me from the text. And the first is this. Jesus invites us to make room at the table for all, especially those who cannot repay us. Jesus invites us to make room at the table for all. Jesus' care and concern is so clearly for the least of these. What would this sound like today? Who would Jesus be telling the Pharisee to invite to dinner? I wonder if Jesus would say something like, when you host a party, invite the poor. Invite those who don't have access to health care or education. Invite the incarcerated, the homeless, refugees and immigrants, orphans, those affected by racial injustice. Invite those who could never repay you. Well, making room at the table is going to look different in each of our lives. And it's going to mean looking around and seeing who the least of these are that Jesus has put in our paths. Well, today, instead of physically inviting someone over for dinner right now, it might look a lot more like dropping dinner off at someone's door, packing meals for Feed My Starving Children, sponsoring a child in Rogi Village, listening to a coworker who has a different set of beliefs or cultural background. Where is Jesus' invitation to you today? How can you make room at the table for those who could never repay you? The second invitation is this. Jesus invites us to live with a posture of humility. Humility is an attitude that is fundamental to discipleship, to becoming more like Jesus. Verses about humility are found all throughout the Bible. I have just listed a few here. There are a couple from Proverbs that talk about humility being the fear of the Lord. Philippians, Paul writes, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Colossians and 1 Peter both talk about clothing yourself with humility. But speaking of this idea of reversal that Luke talks about, isn't humility the opposite of our natural human inclinations towards pride? You're probably familiar with the comedian Jeff Foxworthy's bit on you. You might be a redneck if, don't worry, I'm going somewhere with this. Like you might be a redneck if you put AstroTurf in the back of your pickup, or you might be a redneck if you drink from a garden hose daily. I started thinking you might be human if you've called shotgun to sit in the front seat. You might be human if you've budged or cut in line. You might be human if you peruse the dessert table and take in the biggest or most appetizing piece. You might be human if you've argued that you were right when you knew you were wrong. You might be human if you've seen someone who is homeless and thought, why don't they get a job? And that thought just swept across your mind. Of course, none of these are things that we are proud of. And they don't speak directly to what qualifies us as humans. They do speak to the mess, to the sin that lives in us. And they illustrate when we examine ourselves that we see the pride that so often oozes out of our hearts and into our relationships with God and one another. But Jesus invites us to a life of humility. And out of our own sinful nature, we cannot do it by ourselves. We cannot just muster up more humility. It's only something that God can initiate. The reality that God initiates faith and we respond was one that played a huge part in shifting Martin Luther's understanding of faith and would contribute to the reformation of the church. When we immediately think of October 31st, you probably think of Halloween. It's also the day when Luther pinned the 95 Theses to the Wittenberg door, which would have a ripple effect throughout the church. And we celebrate it today as Reformation Day. From reading scripture, Luther realized that humility wasn't a virtue that earned grace, but it was a necessary response to the gift of grace. Did you catch that? It's not a virtue that earned grace, but it's a necessary response to the gift of grace. In other words, it is God at work in us that orients our hearts towards this posture of humility. We don't just become humble. We are, after all, humans living in this broken world. So outside of asking God for it, which is absolutely critical, 
How do we learn humility? How do we respond to the invitation of Jesus? Humility is learned through practice. Think about it. It takes practice to form patterns in any area of our lives, doesn't it? This is same also of humility. You've heard the saying, it's like riding a bike. You'll just naturally jump back on and be able to ride even if it has been years. But I don't think humility is like that. I think humility is more like trying to learn how to ride the backwards brain bicycle. Now this is a bicycle that engineers designed to challenge their friend to ride. And when they made it, they made the handlebars work in the exact opposite way that bicycles usually work. When you turn the handlebars to the left, it actually points the bike to the right and vice versa. They challenged their friend, Justin Sandlin, who is an actual rocket scientist, to ride this bike. And it took him eight months to essentially rewire his brain so that he could ride the bike his friends had designed. Destin knew the physics of the backwards bike, like he understood how it worked, but it took repeated practice and a rewiring of the neural pathways in his brain to do something that seemed relatively simple. And just a side note, if you're interested, for only $600, you can own your own backwards brain bike. And I don't know that these bikes sold out even with the pandemic rush on bicycles. But learning humility is like this. It takes practice. Jesus knew that this was not an overnight process. We practice humility by living out Jesus' invitation to make room at the table through spending time with him and his word like Luther did. By saying words like, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I don't know about you, but this is an area of my life I find myself so rusty in sometimes. Like I'm all out of practice because I have let my pride run my life and have tried to control it instead of letting God be in charge. And I wonder if there might not be a better time to practice than in the world we're living in right now. In case you haven't heard, there's an election coming up on Tuesday. Some would say it's the most important election of our lifetime. And you might also notice that this is commonly said around every presidential election. But don't worry, we're not going to discuss political parties today or how to vote. But I do want us to be challenged by Jesus' countercultural message that could not be more relevant for us today in 2020, the weekend before the election. Jesus invites us to a life of humility in every area of our lives, including how we think, speak, and act when it comes to politics. Tish Harrison Warren, um, who is an author and an Anglican priest in the North American church, writes this. She says, a robustly Christian political theology requires that Christians become a different kind of people whose lives bear witness to Jesus in ways that the world finds astonishing, perplexing, and unrecognizable. In other words, as we live out our faith, we should bear witness to Jesus. People should notice that something is different about us. She goes on to say, in order to begin this work, we need postures and practices. She says we need postures of humility. Doesn't that sound familiar? of truthfulness, joy, kindness, and love for our enemies. She says these postures are profoundly lacking on both sides of the aisle. The deepest divide in American politics is not between right or left, but between those who are committed to these postures in word and deed and those who are not. So how do we begin the work of bearing witness, of pointing people to Jesus in our world in the days and months ahead? How do we embody this posture of humility? What are some specific practices that we can put in place? That one is just acknowledging our own blind spots. We all have blind spots. We all have inconsistencies, misinformation. And as we acknowledge that we each have these, we can more readily give space for others to have different perspectives. We refrain from being lazy and making assumptions about people. And doesn't that sound a lot like welcoming everyone to the table? 
Second practice is to ask people about their stories, begin to understand where they are coming from, and then listening, genuinely and actively listening without thinking about the next thing we want to say or the next point we want to make. A third practice we can put in place is prayer. Learning how to do this looks like praying that Jesus would teach us the same lesson that he taught the Pharisees and the guests at dinner that day. It looks like spending time on our knees talking to God about stuff. This physical posture of being on our knees is a reflection of our heart's posture when we pray. And it might be a practice you want to try this week in just physically getting down on your knees and praying for our country and our world. Maybe you can't get down on your knees anymore, but with head bowed and eyes closed, you can still come into conversation with God with this same heart posture. There are days and moments where practicing humility is going to feel like trying to ride the backwards brain bicycle. It is counterintuitive and countercultural in so many ways, but it is the way and the invitation of Jesus, and there is no better way to live. Today, we will experience table fellowship together, not unlike the picture from Luke 14 of Jesus' meal at the Pharisees' home. In this practice of taking communion, we have an opportunity to learn through experience. At the communion table, we are experiencing that there is room at the table for everyone. Jesus welcomed all people to the table. Social status didn't matter. Political parties didn't matter. There is no division in Christ. The table is for all, just like in the parable he told the Pharisees that day at dinner. Author Eugene Cho reframes Galatians 3.28 for a modern day audience. He writes, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, Republican or Democrat. You are all one in Christ Jesus. No one comes to the table because we are good enough on our own. It is only through Christ that we can come and receive forgiveness. And it takes humility, doesn't it? To admit, to recognize that we are in need of a savior, a rescuer, and a healer. The communion table. We are also experiencing humility through obedience. We engage in an act of obedience as we take the bread and drink the cup. We focus our attention on Jesus' death on the cross, the clearest example of humility in Christ's life. In the book of Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes this about Jesus' life and death. He says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Rewire your brains. It says, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Humility is the way of the cross. It is the way of Jesus. It is the posture by which we experience more of the life that Jesus intended us to live. And it takes prayer and it takes practice to begin living each day with this Jesus-shaped posture. In Luke 22, Luke records another significant dinner conversation, describing what happened the night before Jesus would go to the cross. He's in the upper room eating the Passover meal with his disciples. See that night that Jesus takes bread, he gives thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, 
saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Let's pray together as we turn our hearts towards receiving this meal. Jesus, we are so humbled to be at your table. We are so humbled by the forgiveness that you freely give us as we come to you. Pray that as we receive this meal today, wherever we are, that we would know that you are our savior and our healer and our peace. We pray that as we take this meal together now, your spirit would be made known. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. Now take, take communion wherever you are, and we will be back in just a few minutes. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled
Thank you so much for joining us in worship online today. It is a joy that we can stay connected this way and be in worship together. We want to close today by praying that the way that Jesus taught us to pray. And as we pray this, um, just think of the words, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And isn't that a humbling thing to, to submit to Jesus and to say, God, you are God and we are not. In the midst of the uncertainty of this week and the challenges of our world, we can pray these same words that Jesus taught his disciples. Will you pray with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now as you go to your week, will you receive these words of blessing from scripture? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and may you know his peace this week. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope you have a great week. If there's any way that we can pray for you, please let us know by dropping an email to prayer at the whychurch.org or contacting one of the pastoral staff. We would love to be in prayer for you. Hope you have a great week. Thanks for joining us today.